Good morning, family. Please be making your way to your seats, and we'll begin singing with Open the Eyes of My Heart, Lord.
The storm is passing over. The storm is passing over. Have a seat, please. <laughs> Good morning, everyone. My name is Meshach Gadu, and I'm very, very happy to be in this building with you this morning. So, yeah, go ahead and clap. Go ahead. <laughs> so I need you to do me a favor, okay? Look to your left. What's my left? What's my right? Now look to your right. What do you see? <laughs> Some of us, I see. People looking at me like I am crazy. <laughs> But I'll tell you what I see. I see a great diversity in this building. Clap. That's a very good thing. We're all here this morning from different culture, different race, different socioeconomic background, and many other identifiers. Why? We're all here this morning because of one single united passion. And that is to be known by Christ. Amen? Amen. And to that end, we are willing to put our differences aside for the sake of Christ. We're able to achieve that which the world has been trying to achieve for a very, very long time and still fails at it. They've tried with legislation in all sorts of ways, but keeps falling short. Why? Because that was never God's original intent on how we come together. There was someone to be a single unifier for us, someone that would bring all our hearts together. And that common unifier is who? But Christ. Christ changes our hearts so that we are willing to put our selfish desires to worship, confess our darkest secrets and sins, and even commune with people that we otherwise would not even speak to on the streets. For some of us, I'm not sure if this is your first time here, but you're attending a church that is very clear that the people have taken the time to understand that God is the hub of everything in their world. And it is our prayer, it is my prayer, that at some time all people come to this understanding. I'm going to end with a uh, paraphrase of Romans uh, 12, uh, verses 1 to 3 by Eugene Peterson. I like how he phrased it. He says, um, here's what I want you to do. God helping you. Take your everyday ordinary life, your sleeping, eating, going to work, and walking around life, and place it before God as an offering. Embracing what God does for you is the best thing you can do for him. Don't become so well adjusted to your culture that you fit into it without even thinking. Instead, fix your attention on God. You will be changed from the inside out. Readily recognize what he wants from you and quickly respond to it. Unlike the culture around you, always dragging you down to its level of immaturity, God brings the best out of you develops well-formed maturity in you. Amen? Amen. So um, sit back, relax, open your hearts. We've got a great message that's going to be shared by a great evangelist. And I hope that it, uh, it, by the end of the service, your heart would be pricked and you would be uh, uh, motivated to, to change and come closer to God. Let's go to God in prayer. 
Dear Heavenly Father, we uh, gathered here this morning, Father, uh, not because we're special people, Father, but because of out of your sheer mercy. You chose us out of the people in the world because you love us and because you want us to have a relationship with you. God, I, I pray for uh, our hearts to, uh, to think about that on a daily basis and know that, um, that you really desire for us to have a relationship with you. God, I pray that we respond accordingly. We think about just the things that you've allowed your son to suffer for our sake so that we can have that opportunity to be able to have that relationship with you. Be with our worship this morning. I pray that the message um, moves our heart in such a way that it, it will help us to humble out. We're very sinful people, and we need to be reminded of that sometimes, God. I pray that uh, you will be completely joyful of how we respond. Lord, uh, at this time also, I would like to uh, 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 bring a prayer request for the Faison's, Sherelle's dad, who went uh, uh, through a procedure at the hospital. God, we pray that you provide healing, uh, that you give him strength, and allow him to be able to resume his normal function very soon, Father. God, we're, we're praying for our children in the children ministry. God, our future Christians, future disciples, we pray, God, that you continue to mold their hearts as we continue to set them the example. Lord, I thank you, and I pray all this in the name of your son, Jesus Christ. Amen. Uh, please stand. We'll be singing Holy, Holy, Holy as we prepare our hearts for communion this morning.
Well, good morning, family. It is so great to be here at home, where home has become a relative term for us as of late. Uh, we moved out of our home in Annapolis about four weeks ago. We are at Camp Pfeiffer right now in the basement when we're not in Oklahoma or Virginia Beach until uh, the Saturday after Thanksgiving when we finally moved to Raleigh, North Carolina. So, oh, yeah, 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 come on. <laughs> not quite sure how to take that. <laughs> if you would, turn over to 1 Corinthians 11. This is a time where we uh, remember the body and the blood of our Lord that was given for us. And if you would, turn to verse 23. This is a passage I'm sure familiar to many of us. In verse 23, Paul says, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. This is why we're here at this time, to remember his body and his blood. And when we read this, and I, I want us to keep in mind what we've been doing as a church here and, and working through corporate repentance and trying to reset our heads on, as, as, as Ed did when he came here and taught through Philippians, all those pronoun you in uh, Philippians are almost all plural pronouns. English is funny that way. We're probably the only Western language that has the same stinking you pronoun and for, for plural or singular. You know, in German, French, Italian, you have different pronouns. But down south, they do have you and y'all, so that is, that is an upside there. And and you ends up in New Jersey, yes. <laughs> and all use in New York. So guys. we're having to improvise. America, I love this country. Okay. Um, and, and when we read this, how, you know, when we read about his blood here, we, he says, poured out for your sins. And we think about Jesus, this is my blood, which is poured out for the forgiveness of many. We think about that. I, I don't know about y'all, all y'all, <laughs> but, but that's the one that grabs my heart because that's bloody, that's brutal, that's horrific, that's undeserved, and I can relate to that. I, I had a job in college picking up bodies for funeral homes for a couple of years, working the night shift, literally, and, and I, I, you know, I can think of that, or I, I can think of the passion of the Christ, or I can read a medical account and... And then I think theologically what it means is here's Jesus without any sin at all having to take that and choosing to take that for me. I, I can get that. But in my own American way, I tend to make it very personal, unique, one-on-one. -on -one. And that's not a bad thing. I have to take the cross personally. But then he also says, here's the bread, which is my body. That one's harder for me because I'm a self-contained guy. I'm a, I'm a standalone disciple. It's so easy for me not to connect to the rest of the body. I need that reminder that I need to be connected to all y'all. I need to be connected with my brothers and sisters in Raleigh, with Annapolis, with, with Anne Arundel County, with Baltimore, wh wherever I'm at, I need to be connected. And I, and I need that reminder, Randy, you're not in this alone. Yeah, you need to work out your salvation with prayer and trembling. Oh wait, no, we're supposed to do that together, aren't we? And that's what we need to remember when we do this. You wanna, yeah. Good morning. Um, as we were driving in this morning and as I was praying and thinking about this last night, I was just thinking, I, I love to just go back and think, what was it like way back then, you know, maybe 10 years after Christ had risen, 20 years, 30 years, 40 years. And I, I constantly do this with myself because I am so, um, I think, you know, I think it's our nature to want to learn a pattern and, and keep doing that pattern over and over again. And yet, but I just really want to let the Holy Spirit go, okay, this is what you should be thinking about, Bev. You know, what, what is it that they thought then? Or what did they, the Christians think a thousand years ago or a hundred years ago? And to just to try and imagine remembering the Lord and what that looked like back then. You know, maybe they just, you know, came together and there was nobody who actually said, okay, this is now the time that we remember the Lord. Maybe it was just the conversation they had every time they got together. You know, when we get together in each other's homes, what are the first things that comes up in your conversations? What are you bringing um, up to your friends? 
to your brothers and sisters? What are you recalling in your week? You know, is it the game? Is it your rough time at work? And I'm sure they've talked about all those things. But I, I, I kind of have to wonder back then that maybe it was always about Jesus when they came together or what they were learning about their relationship with God or um, sharing what they saw in themselves that wasn't Christ-like. And remembering the Lord was something that was just a natural part of this meal time together, this spending time together. And um, so I, I just want to encourage you guys to kind of let your mind wander there and just think, what was, you know, what is it supposed to be like when we remember the Lord? Because there's not a, an outline in the scriptures that say, first you do this, and then you think about that, and here's the next thing. And just kind of just praying about the Holy Spirit leading you in this time of remembering Jesus. Now, in this particular example, we do have in this letter here um, some of the things that was going on, some of the things that were going on and how they had their communion. Zoom back a little bit, like back to verse 17, and we find out that Paul, Paul's epistles tend to be, the, the, most epistles are occasional epistles. There's an occasion, there's a purpose, there's, a, there's, a, there's things to be addressed in a letter. And Paul's theology oftentimes tends to be occasional theology. There's an issue, great opportunity to lay the foundation for the Christian faith there. This is what's going on here. We read those verses that we just read in 23, 26, for I received from the Lord. That really stands alone, doesn't it? You can read that and just glean so much from it that can change your heart and your life. But when you zoom back to verse 17 about why he wrote that, um, he says, but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Now, the immediate instructions right before that had to do with women covering their hair. Way to go, guys, you nailed that one. <laughs> but in the following instructions, I do not commend you. Because when you come together, it is not for the better, but for the worse. For in the first place, when you come together as a church, I hear that there are divisions among you. And I believe it in part. And he addressed that in the first chapter. For there must be factions among you. And those of y'all that are reading the NIV read the word differences. There, there have to be differences among you in order that those who are genuine among you may be recognized. When you come together, it is not the Lord's Supper that you eat. For in eating, each one goes ahead with his own meal. One goes hungry, another gets drunk. What? Do you, do you not have houses to eat and drink in? Or do you despise the church of God and humiliate those who have nothing? What shall I say to you? Shall I commend you in this? No, I will not. There, there will be differences among us. There just will. We'll live in different parts of the area. Some of us will live in Baltimore. Some will live in Annapolis. Some will live in the demilitarized zone of Anne Arundel County in between. <laughs> and you know who you are, okay? Um, but, but what he says is, you guys, when you're not remembering the body. You're just caught up in your own little world of eating and drinking and working. And you, you know, you're not thinking. You're not intentional. You're not being mindful of the rest of the folks that make up your family of believers. And this, this convicts me. And it, it is easy to find your own little circle of friends uh, that look like you, same socioeconomic, same skin color, same background, same accent. It's easy to do that. Mm -hmm. it, and it's easy to just have maybe one friend and you don't connect. And what, well, I think what Paul's saying here is, yes, remember the body of the, 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 the blood of the Lord, but remember his body too. Be mindful. You're one body. You're one family. We're one family no matter where we live here in the area. And we got family all over the world. But for right now, we're celebrating this time together as a family to remember the body and blood of our Lord Jesus. So let's pray. Heavenly Father, what a privilege to have such a gift, such a sacrifice as the body and blood of your son. The blood that washes us clean and the body that we get to walk this journey with. Father, I don't, I, we all need all the help we can get. Thank you for giving us family here. Thank you for giving us friends here. Be with us as we remember, take this bread and take this cup that remembers, that reminds us of your son's body and blood at this time. We pray this through his holy and precious name. Amen.
you would, turn over to 1 Timothy 6. It's a great time, especially in the wake of remembering the body and the blood. I mean, our hearts are at a place where we're thinking about, look at what God has given to me to think about, how can I give back to God? And regardless of which American socioeconomic demographic you may fall into, believe it or not, we're all wealthy. By the world standards, we're all stinking rich in here. Hard to believe, especially if you're in college, but that's where you're at. But, and so Paul writes this uh, in 1 Timothy 6, 17 through 19. As for the rich in this present age, I charge them not to be haughty, nor to set their hopes on the uncertainty of riches, but on God, who richly provides us with everything to enjoy. They are to do good, to be rich in good works, to be generous and ready to share, thus storing up treasure for themselves as a good foundation for the future, so that they may take hold of that which is truly life. Beth's going to share. So last week, Randy and I spent some time in Oklahoma City, and we were in a training, basically learning how the brain works. And one of the exercises, um, we had, they had us close our eyes and um, just think about something very specific. And I was doing some future pacing on our, our um, dreams, basically what we want to do in our kind of the second half of our lives as we prepare to retire, or he prepares to retire. And I was convicted because I had a little flip in that memory. I initially started out, I'm very excited about what we're getting ready to do, um, but some of that excitement, a large part of that excitement is, huh, I wonder what the financial possibilities of this are gonna be. And certainly God created us to work, he created us to earn money, to, he wants us to take care of ourselves and our families and the poor and the church. And in that moment I realized, hmm, what am I mo most excited about? Because this business really is about helping people. That's really our hearts, you know, that started this. But I feel like I have to constantly remember what is the goal? What is the purpose? What is the focus? What is the passion? And I was convicted because I realized, oh my goodness, I don't, I think in this moment I have been excited about the money. And I just stopped and thought about, wow, God, I want this to be different. I want this to be so completely about the people. God provides the, the food and the clothes. You know, in First Timothy 6, it talks about that. If you have food and clothes, that's enough. And, you know, I, we just, you know, loaded up our home about three weeks ago. We we're preparing to move to Raleigh. And I was so convicted throughout the two weeks. Barbara Stack was wonderful, and others have come over to help me pack and get rid of things. And I was really convicted because I'm like, I have so much stuff. I have so much stuff, so much stuff I've held on to. And there's that feeling that I have a lot of times that this brings me happiness. This brings me joy. This, I need this. I need this for life. And I just looked around more and more, and I just thought, oh, my goodness. When they told me the weight of the truck, I was like, I, that's just horrible. And I've been watching Tiny House, and you're kind of dreaming about, like, hey, let's, let's get into this minimalist movement and, you know, just kind of playing with that and asking Randy, like, hey, would you be willing to move into a tiny home? And he's like, no way. <laughs> now, he's a big guy. I'm a tiny person, so maybe he kind of feels like, ah, there would be not, not enough room. But the point of it is really is that I, we just are so blessed, and so often I, I just need to stop and go, wait, what's this life really about? A hundred years from now, what is all this stuff going to amount to? And I really want the life that is life. You know, I think about that. And so I just want to encourage you guys to take a minute, close your eyes, and think about the things you treasure. Maybe one, two, three things. Now, if any of those things were taken away, would you still be happy? And I think that's the thing about God is like, you can't take that away. You can't take away God. You can't take away the life that's truly life. And thank you so much for letting us share. We're going to miss you guys so much. We'll be back on a regular basis. But um, I'm just so grateful to be a part of this movement, this ministry, this fellowship. And thank you for how you've loved us and that we've been able to work and serve together. And I just thank you so much for your, your hearts and your passions. And we'll be praying for you all as we're gone. Thank you. I work for Northrop Grumman, and this will be my third relocation in five years. We hope, prayerfully, it's the last. In James, two, James 4, uh, caveat, if the Lord wills. 
Uh, it's important to keep that perspective. Um, when this first came up, I'll, I'll close out a moment of prayer, but I, I do want to just share this. Um, when work was saying you'll need, it, it's important to integrate the Raleigh office here with headquarters. We'll need you back here, day tripping or something, once or twice a month. And Bev goes, honey, that's a lot of travel. You know, you're not the wo road warrior you used to be. <laughs> and then she realized that our grandson, oh, and, and all you guys too, <laughs> Uh, will still be here, and then she goes, we need to go back once or twice a month or this isn't going to work. <laughs> so, anyway, there you have it. But yes, we, and, and it's funny, we were praying about this on the way about what a safe haven the Baltimore church has been for us. There's been some interesting times. You know, may you live in interesting times in Annapolis. We dearly love our Annapolis family of believers, and we have really grown out of so much at being a part of Baltimore as well. We love this church. I mean, this is an awesome church. Yes. I hope you realize as you were thinking about the body going, man, I get to be in the Baltimore church. This is awesome. So let's pray. Let's give thanks and, uh, as we give. Father in heaven, you have given us so much, and you have given us the life that is truly life. And we are so grateful for that. Father, thank you for the privilege to give uh, in this moment here to, to give to help to meet the operational needs of the church but also help us to be so mindful of how we can give to those, to the poor, the widows, the, the, the orphans, Father, to, to really be caring and involved in our communities. Father, it's a hurting world, and we have so much to give, so much more than we realize. So help us to lift up our eyes, uh, fix them on our Lord, and to live the life that is truly life and share it with those around us. We love you and pray this through his holy name. Amen. Good morning again. Uh, I definitely want to thank Bev and Randy Jenka for uh, sharing the communion with us and bringing us to the cross and reminding us of uh, what ties us all together. So thank you again, Randy and Bev. We'll definitely miss you guys in your transition. We look forward to seeing you again once or twice a month. Uh, but good morning again. Welcome again to the Greater Baltimore Church. My name is Fat Vong, and uh, I am about to give this Sunday's rendition of upcoming announcements. Um, to help us stay connected and tied into all the great things, opportunities uh, that we have together as Jesus has brought us together, like Randy was talking about. I do want to take a moment to uh, welcome Mark and Sandy uh, Felcher, who are visiting from out of town. So welcome to uh, church in Baltimore. It's always great to see you guys here. I've known them for as long as I've been a Christian, so uh, it's a long time. You don't have to ask how many years, but it's a good chunk of time. Uh, but anyway, welcome. If this is your first time uh, joining us for service, uh, or if you if you've joined us many times, again, we're, we're excited to have you here. Uh, a couple great things that are happening this week. Uh, so many great opportunities again for us to really celebrate together uh, and to. Uh, uh, to, to really honor and, and, and celebrate uh, the reason that Christ has brought us together to be one great family. So many great events. So let's mark these opportunities in our calendars. Uh, for the Cedars ministry, we have a, uh, a, uh, a luncheon devotional right after service today. So come on, Cedars. We're excited. Uh, so that, that will be over in the conference room in the classroom wing of the Chesapeake Arts Center right after service. Uh, for a, our North Region Family Group leaders. This is just for our North Region Family Group leaders. If you're a part of this group, uh, just a reminder that we'll be having a Family Group Leaders meeting for the North Group uh, 30 minutes after service. So make sure you're, you're joining us after service uh, with your bagged lunch uh, and ready to have a working lunch for the North Region Family Group Leaders meeting. Uh, for this Wednesday coming up, we'll be celebrating Thanksgiving together as a church family. We'll be here in uh, Brooklyn Park Middle School, which is just the neighboring uh, building uh, to, uh, to the Chesapeake Arts Center. And we'll be there for our Thanksgiving potluck together this Wednesday. We're going to be sending out details about what to bring, but we'll be organizing that by family group. Uh, and so we'll be bringing food together, uh, coming together for a time to celebrate uh, and uh, just enjoy our Thanksgiving meal together as we've done every year. Uh, and that'll be at Brooklyn Park Middle School at 730 this Wednesday. Uh, so please join us for that great opportunity. Uh, it'll be a lot of fun, a lot of food. Uh, so that'll be a great time. Yeah, the kids are very excited. They're crying about it already. They can't wait to join us. 
Uh, also, if you see over here, there's an example of the Thanksgiving baskets uh, that the Jenkins help us to organize and put together every year. Uh, and so this year, we're continuing our Thanksgiving basket campaign. Uh, there's details at the Greater Baltimore Church website under greaterbaltimorechurch.org slash volunteer. Uh, and you can see the Thanksgiving basket details uh, and, and ways of putting that basket together. If you'd like to see how those are put together, you can take a look at our wonderful model over there. Uh, it's not going anywhere for a little while, so take a look, take a glance. Uh, there's also little sheets about it with instructions about how to put those baskets together. Um, the target... Uh, the, the, well, the instruction sheets are available there, they're available online, and they're also available at the book table. Uh, so you can find instructions at any one of those locations. The target this year is to have one basket per two adults or one per four campus students or four teens. Uh, if you can do more than that, that's even better. Uh, but the target, again, is one per every two adults or one per four campus students or four teens. And so let's be able to, to knock that goal right out of the park this year. Uh, if you put those baskets together, Next Sunday, uh, November 19th, if you're not going to be here on the, uh, on the 19th, then pr please bring them to the potluck this Wednesday uh, so we can make sure we get those, uh, those baskets to the families who are in need. Uh, as per usual, we'll also need volunteers driving to help deliver the baskets on Sunday, November 19th. If you're able to help, please contact Wayne Jenkins. Uh, you can see him at the book table. He's also here in the front, uh, in the fourth row here. Um, and uh, please contact Wayne Jenkins if you're able to help. His phone number is 443-257-9410. If you need that number again, you can check with me, or you can go on the church website, and you can find information there as well. So again, we'll need drivers. Please contact Wayne if you're able to help deliver the baskets next Sunday. Uh, also coming up as well next Sunday, one of our campus students, Micah Lindsay Young, is having her. Uh, come on, Micah. And for if you're familiar with performance majors, these recitals are very important uh, and a lot of hard work. So if you're able to come, it's an open invitation to the whole church. Uh, her junior voice recital will be next Sunday, November 19th uh, at 2 p.m. as well. So please join if you're able to join for her junior voice recital uh, and be praying for her uh, and all the work that goes into that recital. Amen. Uh, also, next Sunday, we'll be having part two of our, our parenting workshop in terms of Every Piece Matters. Uh, if you were able to join us last time, it was a great time together with all the families. Again, we'll be getting together with all the parents for all families. Uh, please join us. Lunch will be provided. It'll be next Sunday, immediately following service. Uh, and uh, that'll be over, uh, it'll be here at the, the, at the building. So that'll be our parenting devotional for next Sunday, November 19th. Um, and then just a plug and a reminder for the Save the Date for our marriage conference that's coming up, which is March 9th through 11th. Uh, yep. The teens are so excited about it. I don't know. They just want the, their parents out of the house. Um, but that'll be March 9th through 11th, 2018. Mark your calendars. It's going to be a fantastic event. Thanks so much for your attention. And we have one last announcement from Winston Phillip. Good morning, everybody. I have some announcements about uh, our awesome Christmas service coming up, just to remind us, uh, a bunch of us that are involved with the, uh, some of the rehearsals. So we have choir rehearsal today uh, in the other building at 6 o'clock. Uh, if you're part of the Christmas dance uh, production, and you, we have rehearsal at 12 in the dance studio, and if you want to be part of it, you can also go over and uh, try to get in, because you know you got to get in. And then, I also would like to see Emily Vigil, Christian Wills, Terrence Martin, Adima Essien, and Ryan Zeitler stage left after service. And then we'll have also a um, quick board meeting stage right after service. So if you don't know your stage directions, just stand in the middle and find the group you belong to. Thank you. <laughs>
Amen. We got a great cloud of witnesses, CJ said, surrounding us here that you can't see. They're the angels in heaven. Amen. Uh, let's go to God in prayer. I'm going to look at some things this morning together. Let's go to God in prayer. Father, we love you. We thank you for this time together. We thank you for uh, the great God that you are and all that you do in our lives. We thank you for allowing us to come together and worship in this way and gather and honor you. We pray that our, our worship is honoring to you and that you help refine our character to be more like your son in every way. God, guide us, direct us, uh, be with us, uh, protect us. And Lord, we pray for all that's going on in the country that you would uh, be the safe haven that people reach out to and see is the solution for all of our ills. God, be with us and guide us. In your son Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Uh, we've been looking through the book of Mark, talking about uh, our theme has been Jesus in action. And uh, we're going to continue to do that. And we're going to look at uh, Mark chapter 11 this morning. Uh, the curse and the cure is the title of the message. The curse and the cure is the title of our message this morning. I hope you guys are doing well. Doing all right? Are you cold? Yes. It's that time of year. So uh, we're cold outside, but it's warm. The heat, the Spirit of God is in here. Amen? And so Mark chapter 11, and we will start together uh, in verse 11. And I noticed that there's no monitor this morning. I'm looking for the monitor to read off of. So uh, I got to cheat. So, okay, I, mean, I got to use this thing. All right, verse 11, Jesus entered Jerusalem and went into the temple courts. He looked around at everything, but since it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. The next day as they were leaving Bethany, Jesus was hungry, singing in the distance a fig tree and leaves to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, he found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then he said to the tree, may no one ever eat fruit from you again. And his disciples heard him say it. That's intense, right? Uh, on verse 15, on reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were selling uh, or selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling doves, and he would not allow anyone to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And as he taught them, he said, It's not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you have made it a den of robbers. And I can just imagine... Because the Bible says that he's driving out the money changers, he's turning over tables, and then it says, and he's teaching them. And it reminds me of those old moms that kind of discipline you in a corporate spanking, and they preach to you at the same time. Don't you ever! Well, that's kind of my vision of what's happening here. And it says that he's holding back the people from, I don't even know how he did that. He's stopping them from leaving the temple, maybe with the, you shall never pass. I don't know what he's doing, but he's stopping them from leaving. He's turning over tables, and he's preaching the word of God simultaneously. He's a multitasker. God's just amazing. Amen? Verse 18, the chief priests and the teachers of the law heard this and began looking for a way to kill him. For they feared him because the whole crowd was amazed at his teaching. When evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, and they went out to the, to the city. In the morning as they went along, they saw the fig tree withered from the roots. Peter remembered and said to Jesus, Rabbi, look, the fig tree you cursed has withered. Have faith in God. Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, if anyone says to this mountain, go and throw yourself into the sea, and does not doubt in their heart, but believes that what they say will happen, truly I tell you, if anyone says, to, uh, I'm sorry, truly I tell you, uh, if anyone says to this mountain, go throw yourself in the sea, and does not doubt, in their heart, but believes what they say will happen, it will be done for them. Therefore, I tell you, whatever you ask for in prayer, believe that you have received it, and it will be yours. And when you stand praying, if you hold anything against anyone, forgive them, so that your Father in heaven may forgive your sins. There's a lot in this passage. We're not going to go through all of this. I'm going to focus on one part today. I'm going to focus on the, on the curse and the cure. Someone else is going to pick up and talk about the power of prayer and the other things that are mentioned in the passage. I'm not really going to focus on that this morning. Uh, but it's a pretty amazing passage, pretty astonishing passage and confusing passage. As Jesus is preaching, teaching, discipline, rebuking, turning over tables all simultaneously. And what is this obsession with figs? What's the obsession? With food, maybe, because we've had issues of bread, issues of fish, now issues of figs, uh, and what's going on with Jesus that he'd be so mad at this tree that he tells it that you will never bear fruit again. Could any of us act like this and get away with it? I'm just saying. Could it, I 
mean, could you imagine the, the mom that comes home? She, her, her, you know, the husband's there, the kids are there, and they've just been at church, and she goes out to get some groceries. She comes back, dad's sitting reclining on the, on the sofa watching football. The house is a wreck. The kids are, are running amok all over the place. And she comes in, she's upset, and she starts turning over tables. He said, honey, you need to be like Jesus. I am being like Jesus. Would that work? Jesus did it. We can't see ourselves doing that, right? Let's look at verse 15. Maybe some of this will help. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. It may help if we have a little background on the temple. And so the Jerusalem temple was built for worship. All parts of the temple were consolidated and built in such a way as, we could, as, the, as the Jews could worship. And the court of the Gentiles is the court where Jesus turned over. He turned over the tables. And the court of the Gentiles was just this. First of all, there were four courts. Main courts was the court of the priests, the court of Israel, the court of the women, and the court of the Gentiles. And the entire, entire temple compound was considered holy. The whole compound, huge as it was, was considered holy. Let's go to the next slide. Holy, but it became increasingly more holy as you proceeded through the course of the temple from east to west. So the court of the Gentiles sat on the outer skirts of the temple itself, but as you went into the temple from east to west, it was considered even more holy as you then became or became part of the Holy of Holies and the curtain that separated the presence of God there. And so the outermost area of the temple, Jerusalem, is called again the court of the Gentiles. And because it was entered in by all people, anyone could enter that part of the court itself. Jews were only permitted to enter the other parts of the temple. And certainly the priests were only, uh, only allowed to enter the most holy parts of the temple. But Jews were only considered or be able permitted to enter the most holy parts of the temple or any other part rather than the court of the Gentiles. They could walk in, but they were forbidden to go any further than the outer court. The Gentiles could come in, but they could only remain in the outer court from entering any other part of the courts. And there are warning signs in both Greek and Latin that if you entered these other courts, you would be put to death. So the Gentiles had one, it's a huge segment that they could worship in and participate in and come to see God in. But any other part of the temple that they entered into, they were entered into, there were warning signs in both Greek and Latin that you could be put to death. And the Roman Empire at that time uh, allowed the Jews to, to go ahead and execute that to the extent that if you were a Roman citizen and crossed the line and entering parts of the temple, you too could be put to death. There was a market there, also in this court of the Gentiles. And that's where we see all this activity going on. And this market was selling sacrificial animals and birds. Merchants haggled with Jewish pilgrims. There was also money exchange that went on. Since the temple dues were, were, were due at different times, and it had to be paid by coinage. And so they had to exchange their money in Tyrian coinage, no matter where they were coming from, to pay the temple tax. And most people had in Jerusalem, Jerusalem coinage, and so they exchanged this, uh, this money, and there was overtaxing and cheating. And so as they, over, as they exchanged money for uh, 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 Tyrian coinage, often there was overtaxing of that money. We were just in uh, Jamaica for a marriage retreat that my wife and I did. And while we were there, we had to exchange some U.S. dollars for Jamaican dollars. And the exchange rate was 129 to 1. So if for one dollar, U.S. dollar, I got 129 Jamaican dollars. I was rich. I took out hundred dollars and was like, put it on the table. Give me a million Jamaican dollars. And uh, I put my money out, and the woman exchanged it at 119 or 120 to one. And I said, well, I'm looking at the exchange rate to one. You owe me some money. And she smiled at me, gave me my money, and said, next. And I got a little bit cheated. And that's kind of what was going on. There was not only this tax, but they would, the exchange rates weren't, uh, uh, weren't equitable. And they had different exchange rates going on. Josephus, Josephus rather, of the Jewish historian says, records that some priests would even set up tables for themselves to profit from the exchange. That's kind of what's happening in here. But they had religious leaders who set up uh, their own tables in the temple courts of the, uh, uh, where the Gentiles met. And they were exchanging money and he also records uh, that one Passover week, 
over 255,000 animals were sold for sacrifice. 255,000 animals in one week sold for sacrifice. And so this is the type of thing that's going on in that court of the Gentiles. And Jesus is, this is the place that Jesus turned over the tables. And what's interesting about this, the court of the Gentiles was not designated for this originally. The purpose of the court had been, had really been defiled. It was defined initially, this was a place where Gentiles and pagan beliefs could come to the Jewish temple. Who they may have celebrated and worshipped many gods, or maybe no gods, or one god. Uh, but they came in contact with the truth of the one and living God. They came in contact with God's representative, the Jewish people. And the beliefs of the Jewish people were supposed to be an influence in the temple and that housed the presence of God. The court of the Gentiles was the court of evangelism, they called it. It was the court of evangelism to the nations. So the idea was you were, you were a Gentile. You would come in contact with the Jewish, rep or rather God's representatives, the Jewish people in the temple. Their spiritual influence would be influencing you. You may come with different belief system, but when you came to the temple, you were influenced by who, God, who God's people were. And somehow it had gone from that to this celebration of, of a bizarre type of thing where they're selling animals and taxing people, and the Jewish leaders turned the space into a profit-making enterprise, like a Wall Street trading floor. And this was the place that the Gentiles were supposed to find God through quiet reflection in prayer. That's what it was designed for. But it became something altogether different. And one scholar puts it rather than praying for the Gentiles, the Jews were now praying on the Gentiles. And that was the challenge. That's what Jesus walked into. And on his way to the temple, Jesus curses his fig tree and so one of the things I want to look at before we go on and talk about the fig tree and the connection between the temple is how awesome it is. It's not some story. And so I want to do this more for the teens because I get questions all the time. How can you believe the Bible? I want to look at years before this actually happened. 600 years in Micah, in Jeremiah and Isaiah, this is prophesied about. This particular event is actually prophesied about. They're talking about Jesus. They're talking about this event happening. They're talking about him turning over the tables. They're talking about his, his indignation for God's house not being a house of prayer. And so let's look at Micah chapter 7. Micah chapter 7, just very quickly, we'll go through this. You guys with me this morning? Micah chapter 7, verse 1. What misery is mine? I'm like one who gathers summer fruit at the gleaning of the vineyard. There is no cluster of grapes to eat, none of the earthly figs that I crave. And this is a reference to the cursing of the fig tree. This is Micah prophesying that the Messiah would denounce this tree. And we go on in Jeremiah 15. I will take away their harvest, declares the Lord. There will be no grapes on the vine. There will be no figs on the vine. Leaves will wither. What I have given them will be taken from them. This again is the prophetic that the Messiah will see the, the, the uh, uh, decline of morality, the decline of worship, the decline of faith. And there will be judgment from him. And, you know, when you struggle, does the Bible true? Does, does God really know what he's talking about? Six, seven hundred years before this ever comes to be, God prophesies to the letter that it's going to happen. And how do you do that? How does that happen? Someone talking about your life 700 years before it ever happens. That you were a chosen people to be reconciled with God and God has a plan to get you on the path of serving him. Jeremiah chapter 7 verse 11. The house which bears my name become a den of robbers to you. But I've been watching, declares the Lord. These are prophecies six, seven hundred years before this ever Jesus knows. The Bible is right. You can trust it. It is reliable. And I know sometimes we struggle. With, we really put our faith in God. How does this happen except God is orchestrating the details from the very, very beginning? And yet, what is this really about? What makes the passage more challenging is Mark's own statement. In verse 13, he says, Seeing in a distance the fig tree and leaf, he went to find out if it had any fruit. When he reached it, 
He found nothing but leaves because it was not the season for figs. Then why does Jesus now hold the tree accountable and responsible for something it's not able to produce? It's one thing that Jesus cursed the tree. He cursed the tree for not producing figs, for not producing fruit. But what Mark says in his own words is, it wasn't the season for fruit. It wasn't supposed to be producing figs. And it's almost like, you, you, you know, you, you go to Chick-fil-A on Sunday and you know it's closed. <laughs> right? You know it's going to be closed on Sunday. Why did you go? You go up to the drive-thru. And you go up and you sit there putting in your order. Can I have a number four with a strawberry lemonade and um, a Chick-fil-A sauce? Obviously, I've been there a few times. <laughs> it's the, the, the thing. It's closed. And you say, stupid Chick-fil-A, what's wrong with you? And you put a curse. Chick-fil-A's fault. You weren't supposed to be asking for a number four on a Sunday. And Jesus is asking to produce something it's not capable of doing because humans take as if cursing the, uh, the fig tree is arbitrary, unreasonable, and unjustified. It's the last, and this is interesting to me as well, this is the last recorded miracle in Mark. The last one. Every other miracle that Jesus uh, records, you know, may no, other, uh, no, no one ever eat fruit from you again, verse 14. But every other miracle that he records is performed for human benefit. And it's kind of like, why are you wasting your power cursing a tree that can't produce fruit? We need you. Heal somebody. And we may be indignant that way because Jesus is doing this. And yet it turns out this was for human benefit as well. Cursing the fig tree is a sign, and we're going to talk about it in just a second. And something I don't typically do, I like to talk about and, and identify the issues first and then illustrate it. But I'm going to illustrate it first, and then I'm going to talk about what the issues are. And so, but this was from human uh, benefit as well. So what I need are some volunteers. I need um, six people. I think i got six chairs. And uh, I'm going to move this podium out of the way. But I need six chairs, six people. I get two teens at least. Two teens. I got no money this time, so you know. I know, that's why you're raising your hands. You're waiting for some. Okay. Oh, I got, I got a couple other bold people. Come on. You don't even know what I'm going to ask of you, but come on. What do I got? One, two, three, four, five. Uh-oh, Eli's trying to take your seat, John. Oh. And so, uh, if we could bring up the next slide there, and I got something really nice for you guys, actually. You got a treat. I know what these are. I know what these are. Jelly bellies are gourmet jelly beans. Delicious in every way. Uh, used to be that they were very difficult to, to find in the stores. Now you can get them almost anywhere, Amazon and different places. Uh, but these aren't normal jelly bellies. If you could bring up, these are bamboozled jelly beans. So what that means is uh, you have an array of colors, but a disorder. So you could get a top banana, which is beautiful, or pencil shavings. Blue, you can get berry blue or toothpaste, peach or barf, caramel corn or moldy cheese, chocolate pudding or canned dog food, coconut or baby wipes, juicy pear or, or booger, one of my favorite, strawberry jam or centipede, oh my gosh, uh, butter popcorn or rotten egg, licorice or skunky spray. Do you still want to remain on the stage? Okay, so... Uh, if I could have my, my, I had a little dial with that. Yes, I'll take that. And so what you get to do is you get to spin this little dial, and then whatever color it lands on, you pick the color and hope for the best. <laughs> now, CJ is going to give me a couple of napkins, and if you are allergic to, to sugar and candy, uh, you certainly can leave the stage at this time, or if you are afraid, uh, yes, it's okay. <laughs> It's okay. 
Whoa, come on, sire. So we'll have everybody go one time and see what we get here. If you state your name, your occupation, and social security number in case we have to call the emergency. No, just, just your name is fine. And you spin the dial for us. All right, James. James Bonner. There we go. It's not spinning? CJ broke my dial. There you go. Try it again. There you go. That's what you got a purple one. So, there's no purple in there, bro. You're colorblind. Uh, we got <laughs> You've got, uh, man, I can't see either. Oh, it's strawberry is what it is. That's what it says. Yep, yep. Strawberry jam or centipede? It's the dark, that's the one. You're supposed to eat it now, my brother. That's fine. You're lucky. You got strawberry jam, ladies and gentlemen. He's a lucky man. Okay. Eli here. Eli, spin that for us. What you got? Okay. Coconut or baby wipes, I think it is. So that's the white one. <laughs> so you got some friends out there. You got coconut or... You like baby wipes. I don't know which one it is. Okay. State your name. Sire. Sire. Just in case he doesn't make it. Oh, gosh. Juicy pear or booger? That's the lighter green one. I'm, I'm, con I'm concerned. I'm concerned. Either he likes juicy pears or he eats his boogers. We don't know. Uh, hey, you know you do it. I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Uh, Savannah. Savannah, here we go. Right. What was it, juicy pear? I don't think so. <laughs> okay, you got light blue there. Go ahead. Very blue toothpaste. No, oh, okay. Toothpaste tastes good. Okay, he I'm also, Christian. Christian, also, uh, pear or booger? That's the light green one. I hope you get a booger. You can go again. Okay. <laughs> you got pear again? No, he did not. I got, wait, it's pear. <laughs> And that's booger. That's what I thought. Okay, there you go. Uh, moldy, cheese moldy cheese or caramel corn? Uh, that is the uh, this one. Yellow. Yellow. And yeah, and yeah. Holy cheese. You can spit it out if you want. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> Thank you very much. <laughs> Scott. I'm, I'm preaching. I, I don't get Let's have it out here. All right, all right, all right. Okay, okay. I will pick one that nobody picked. No one picked uh, this like thing. Okay, here we go. Strawberry. Oh, my 
my gosh, moldy cheese. <laughs> Woo! <coughs> Don't let some... Oh, that's nasty. Moldy cheese. My favorite. You said... Scott, that was a waste of time. What was that all about? Very important illustration to the issue of the fig tree. So the fig tree and what we've just done is communicate. I'm struggling. <laughs> Woo! I don't need more water than that. There's an expectation that when you look at something... Going to, it communicates one thing, but it actually communicates something else. And the jelly beans were false pretense. They were fake. We thought we were getting one thing, but we actually got something altogether different. We reached and we found nothing but leaves, he says. In verse 14, he says, Then he said to the tree, May no, other, um, no one ever eat fruit from you again. Jesus cursed the tree. Pretense. That's why it was cursed. The fig tree is cursed on the basis of pretense for its leaves. The leaves indicated that they were in full broom. And what the leaves were suggesting was there was fruit on the tree. It's not an issue of it not being in season. The leaves said because they were in full bloom, there is fruit. Come and eat it. And Jesus comes and curses the tree based on the fake news that it was communicating. Not because it didn't have any fruit. But because it said if there was fruit and there wasn't, it was communicating a false pretense on the basis of, of and the reason to expect first fruit. He did not wither the tree for fruitlessness, but for falseness. It conveyed an image that wasn't true. It conveyed an image that wasn't true. The leaves are a sad substitute for fruit, whether talking about fig trees, Pharisees, or any of us. Jesus is concerned about style without substance. We must be careful that our house, our house of worship, is not a, a place of substance, is a place of substance, and not a display of empty rituals, of human interpretations, of meaningless symbols. We can give the display that we are holy from the exterior, but on the interior, we are not holy. We are not producing the fruit for his church to produce. He then turns over the tables. The connection in the temple is a similar issue. The house of God dwells in us. And in us, we may sure display false pretense. Look like we're in bloom as Christians when we're not. An expectation of spiritual growth when there isn't. Hypocrisy is more than living contradictory to God's word. It's also failing to produce what is promised. It's also about not producing what God has promised Christians should produce. It's not enough to say, I don't fall into immorality, or I'm not falling into masturbation, or I'm not falling into impurity. But what about the holiness that we should display as Christians? What about the purity that we display? What about the righteousness we display? What about us if people were to really see the substance of our lives and would really communicate Christ? And on the outside, we have this mature leaf. We're all dressed up like a fruitful tree. But on the inside, we're not really living in the way that God would want. And the connection here, that we have received, the church had received, the Israelites had received incredible blessing. Chosen by divine appointment. Blessed beyond measure. And yet their presence, rather than drawing people to him, became a corrupting influence. That temple of the Gentiles, that court of the Gentiles, because of the influence of an unrighteous group of people, the Pharisees and leadership at that time, was a corrupting influence on that group. And though their leaf seemed mature and should bear the fruit of the Spirit, it did not. Galatians 5, verse 22. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, patience, Peace, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, self-control against such things, there is no law. And one of the things I had to ask myself as I looked at this passage, am I a mature leaf without substance? 
If I am a mature leaf not producing the fruit of God, how am I doing in joy, in peace, in patience, in kindness, in goodness, in faithfulness, in gentleness, in self-control? My life 20-some years, 30-some years in to the Christian game, do they see me growing and not just a leaf that's mature, but a leaf that's bearing the fruit of God as an individual and as God's church? I had to ask myself these questions. It's not good enough just to be a team that shows up at church every week and have the kingdom lingo down straight. But are you growing and changing in the way that God wants? How are you doing respecting your parents? What is your tongue like at home? How are you uh, contemptuous or angry? Who are you when you're by yourself? Or are marriages? I've heard more about people in our church wanting to get divorced than I ever have in my life. And look, there may be good reasons, but the Bible's got to be the standard. We can't just be mature leaves on the outside and then on the inside when we're home, we are completely different than what God asks us to be. And it's not just about living a contradictory life, it's about are we fulfilling the promises of God in our lives every day? Are we growing in the fruits of the Spirit? Are we developing who God has demanded and, and, and called us to be? Our marriages are anger and, and, and contemptuousness and all the things that we could talk about that people see when you are home. But when you're here, we get smiling faces. Sometimes, don't tell the truth. What's really going on? What was your bedroom like last night, Marys? I know, most dividing time on Sunday morning is not just the worship service. Most dividing time is that ride in the car on the way to church and the conversations we have. You didn't put the toothpaste back. Again. I'm tired of this. How dare you? And we're not growing in our patience. We're not growing in our goodness. We're not growing in our kindness. Our kindness to each other. Well, how are our friendships in the congregation? How are our relationships? Are we always looking for what's wrong or are we trying to build one another up? As the Bible talks about. Is it coming to church and, you know, we got our list out. Oh, that wasn't right again. What, and that brother's hair isn't shaved, and his pants are too high, and her dress is too short, and her glasses aren't on straight, and that song wasn't spiritual, and you know, there was a, that didn't really connect to the gospel message, and you know what, that communion, okay, look, I get it. We can point out all the things wrong in the church every day. But I here to build one another up in the word of God. And sometimes we get so hypercritical that we don't see the forest for the trees. We can't focus on building up the kingdom for tearing it down. And we think in tearing it down, we're building it up. That's God's job. That's not your job. That's not your job. I'm working to grow in the way we can be a, look like a mature leaf. And yet on the other side of that, there's no substance or real fruit. How are you doing in this, college students? Oh, man, it's so hard being a college student. You don't get it, bro. You don't get it. You're 55 years old. There's no way you can get it. I got 100 credits, and I'm on the hardest programs that the world has ever invented. Didn't have this program when you went to school, bro. You don't get it. Didn't have science and math back then. They got science and math together in classes now, dude. You don't get it, man. There'll always be something. And you're right. Honestly, I don't totally get it. I am old. That much I get. I can't always relate. I get that too. The Bible says there's nothing new under the sun. There'll always be something to distract us, to deter us from our goal of spirituality, to, to set us on a different journey, a different path other than God, whether it's academics or intellectualism or, or humanism or whatever it is. There's going to be something that grabs our heart and says, well, this is the thing I need to run after, uh, run after to that will make me spiritually mature. And then we become that leaf because we lack spiritual maturity. And there's no real fruit behind it. Look, I get it. You got exams and finals. Back in the day, I, 
did carry 18 credits and work 60 hours a week, but it's a long time ago. Yeah, I had to take organic chemistry twice, but I passed it the second time. I took biochem twice. I passed it the second time. It was rough. I think it was rough for all of us. And I did pledge a fraternity while in school. I did. I don't think it was the best judgment. Probably one of the not so good things that I did. But you know what I did? I, I said that you know, I won't pledge this fraternity unless I can go to church every Sunday. And if I can't go to church every Sunday, you won't see me. You know what they did? They let me go to church every Sunday. Matter of fact, the line master had to bring me to church. His name was Al Essien. <laughs> Al Essien had to bring me to church every week. And so he started bringing me to church every week and loved the message so much, then he got baptized. I'm not kidding you. That's what happened in the mainline church that we were in. And so, yeah, I don't get it. I don't get it. I don't get how God can't be the standard in everything we do. I don't get why God can't be first. I don't get why we have to keep putting stuff in front of Jesus and then claim that we got a mature leaf in front of us. I don't get it. I don't get it why we can argue, fight, even curse in our households at our husbands and wives and then come to church with smiling faces and not confess our sin. I don't get it. I don't get how we can claim to be righteous disciples of Jesus Christ and him not be Lord of everything we do. No, I don't get it. I don't get it. And you don't need to get that either. Jesus has got to be the standard. And our maturity has got to be growing in him. And the issue of him turning over tables is looking at a group, a religious group, that is supposed to be living righteously, setting an example of influence. When they walked into those temple courts, the idea was they would fall down before God and recognize what a group that loved God so much. And they had turned into a bizarre a bizarre of self-fulfillment, and that was the curse. But there was a cure. Let's read Matthew 21. The wonderful conclusion to this passage is actually not found in Mark. It's found in Matthew. Matthew 21 says, The blind and the lame came to him at the temple. And so after Jesus and, Mark, and Matthew 21 turns over the tables, he stays. He stays, and he's not just holding people back. He begins to touch people and reach out to them. And at the temple, he healed them. But when the chief priests and the teachers of the law saw the wonderful things he did, and the children shouting in the temple courts, Hosanna, the son of David, they were indignant. So what did Jesus do? Yes, he turned over the tables. Yes, he was indignant. Yes, he was upset because they had made his temple a place of thieves and not, not a prayer. But then he stayed, and he healed that place. He reached out to people, and he's preached the word of God, and he restored their faith. And then the children were the ones who praised him, saying, Hosanna in the highest. Just meaning, please save, please save, please rescue. Or it was a statement of deliverance granted or deliverance anticipated, either one. They were standing there praising God of deliverance. Bring us deliverance. Thank you for the deliverance. And there was a place of restoration, not just of a curse. There was a cure. There's a cure for every single one of us who have found us for ourselves in a stagnant place. There's a cure for every Christian who, no matter how long you've been a disciple, you reach that wall. I, I feel like I reach it periodically. I feel like I reached it this year. No, I thank God for Randy and Bev. I mean, Randy has no idea. We... Uh, We've had some of the most incredible times, 5 o'clock, 6 o'clock in the morning. And we drive out and meet each other at Cracker Barrel. And sometimes we don't have a whole lot to say, but we look at each other. But, you know, just the words of wisdom from him. And, we know, here's the thing about Randy and I. We are in conflict in many ideas that we have. Now, some, along the line, we come to a, a meeting of the minds and stuff. But one of the things I've learned about good relationships is that you, can, you need to respect people. You don't have to agree with everything. And I love my relationship with Randy. Love my, and it didn't start that way. I can be honest. When Randy and I first met, we had some, some really agonizing, challenging, 
is Scott going to like me? Is Randy going to like me? You know, we're, we're going through some rough stuff. He had been disfellowshipped in the church that he was in in Annapolis, I think wrongfully. And I stepped in to try to help correct that situation, as well as some other brothers here in the church with Charles and Dale and some others and Ed Anton. But we had a lot to work through. And there were some trust issues. I don't know that Randy trusted me a whole lot. And the truth of the matter is, I was doubtful of our relationship, and I didn't trust him a whole lot. I didn't really know him. We started getting together almost twice a month, sometimes more, meeting 6 o'clock, 5 o'clock in the morning, just to pray and to talk and to air our differences. And all, lo and behold, God restored something. He built something. And I really, bro, I just want to say to the whole church how much I appreciate you. Your humility, your working through that, wrestling through all the issues. Uh, I love you to death. We're going to miss you tremendously. And thank you for the example that you set in all of that. Amen. <laughs> Hosanna. Deliverance granted. It is an issue, no matter how long you've been a Christian, you can reach a place of healthy spiritual growth. No matter how long you've been here, and you get to that place where you think, and I've, got, I've been there, where it's like, man, i got to get this done, and so then anger precedes faith. Or my temperament outshadows God's blessings and, and grace. And then the means kind of justifies the end as long as things are going in the direction that I kind of want. And I feel like I've hit that wall this year. And one of the helpful things about my relationship with Randy is just remembering that when you do things the right way, God blesses it over time. It may not happen right then. It may not happen today or in that moment. But you got to keep ebbing away with the right faith, doing things in the right way. You know, you just can't uh, just sit there and think that if I do this my way, that God is going to bless it. He is delivered. He is restored. There are marriages that are broken right now, that are in the kingdom, that are, that are disciples of Jesus Christ. Things aren't going quite the way you want. They can be healed if parties are willing to do what is right before God and do it the right way. I believe that with all of my heart. And if two parties are willing to do that, you can have reconciliation, you can have restoration. If one party is only willing to do that, then the reconciliation is between you and God. You're doing what God wants. And I don't know what the other party may choose, but you do what God wants regardless of what the other party decides. Let God bless you because you've decided to walk the journey in the path of righteousness and not just be a leaf in bloom without the substance that goes behind it. You decide to live out that godly life. And I believe that God will bless it. He is a restorer. He is the cure for addiction. He is the cure for impurity. He is the cure for all the struggles that we go through. He is the cure for loneliness. He is the cure for singleness. If you are struggling with being single, I need a husband or a wife so bad. Now, I guess it's that brother over there. <laughs> Jesus is the solution. He's the solution. I don't know that you guys believe this. And I think where we don't believe it is where the blooming leaf takes precedent over, over a substantive life of righteousness. Not just to restore his temple, Jesus' house, our house. He is here to restore a house of prayer to be open and reopen to the promise of his salvation for all nations. Is our individual house encouraging, inspiring, influencing people to come to God, a house of all for all nations where they can come and know him? And is this house, this collective house, doing the same? Is it doing the same? I believe, I believe because of what we've read today, that the curse, yes, there needs to be reconciliation. God is, 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 is troubled by what he sees, but he gives us a path to salvation and restoration through his son. And you as a teen, as a campus student, as a single, as a married, we all today need to choose that path. And where you are troubled and there is challenges in your relationships, I'm here to tell you the reason is you've not allowed yourself to surrender and totally submit to that path of restoration. And so I ask you today, 
to make a decision. I ask you today to do something that I've not asked in a long time. If you take some time to study this out for yourself, if you're a Christian, you need to dig into the Word and really find out how God can restore your faith and put you on the path that He wants. If you've been coming for a while and looking at the Bible, looking, examining the church, forget about the church. This isn't about the church. This is about you and your relationship with God. And I want you to take some time to open your Bible up, maybe get somebody that can help you read through the Scriptures and try to understand what that restoration looks like for you. Then I believe that once you start reading and studying and examining the Word of God, you're going to come to a conviction that there's no way that you can have that peace that the Bible talks about in Galatians 5.22 without being surrendered to who God is. And then you'll have a decision to make. Do I walk my path or do I walk his? Do I allow God to restore things, to heal me, to place his hand on me as he did in the temple? And do I get to proclaim, Hosanna, Jesus saved. Jesus save, Jesus restore, Jesus heal. Do I proclaim it because that's what he's doing and do I proclaim it because that's what he's done? We get to proclaim it because of both. If you're a disciple. And if you're not, then proclaim it because he's working to do it in your life right now, right here. In December, we'll be closing out the book of Mark. I'll be doing a message on, Matthew, on Mark 16, 16 on baptism. If you've been coming and you've never been baptized the way that the Bible, the way the Bible teaches, then the scriptures teach that you have not followed the path of restoration. That it's impossible for you to have the path of restoration without concluding that with an understanding of what baptism is and connecting to God through that. There's more to it than that. I don't want to make baptism a cure-all. That's not it. But we're going to talk about what that path looks like with baptism included in the, in the scenario. And you need to study your Bible and come to a conviction about all these things. But I'm going to take the time on that date to go through what the salvation process looks like. How do we reach a path of, uh, of restoration? What does that path look like when God presents it? And you get to choose whether I'm willing to accept the truth or not. Or will I be bamboozled? You get to make that choice. There is a curse, but the cure is right there before us. I pray that we choose it. I pray that we choose to do what's right. To God be the glory. Amen. And now let's stand. Sing a song. The ladies are going to start us out on this.
got one more announcement. Amen. You guys go ahead and be seated. Uh, amen. What a, what a great service. Uh, and uh, I don't know how Scott got from puke, puke uh, flavored jelly beans to that, but uh, that was an awesome, awesome message. Amen. Uh, and um, uh, just one last thing. Um, actually, if the Jenkins could come back uh, up here really briefly, because uh, Randy might not even want me to be doing this, but so briefly, uh, I just want, I do want to do want to thank thank them. Uh, they really have been such a, a vital part to uh, the the church in Annapolis, and uh, really in a lot of ways help hold things together when things got really crazy. Uh, and I know we've been so grateful for them how they've they've really held the uh, the church together. And, um, yeah, and uh, Scott shared some great things about them already. But really, just uh, want to present them with a, with a few gifts here. Uh, some flowers. Uh, we'll give those to Bev. <laughs> the, uh, the refreshments and the, uh, you know, the fragrance of Christ they really kept in the church. And, and got a book from Sam Lang, Warrior, for, uh, for you guys, because you really have been warriors uh, there in Annapolis. So we love you guys so much. And... Um, We'll be sad to see you go. Amen. 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 Let's go ahead. And we'll go, God, in a, in a brief word of prayer, and then we'll be dismissed. Uh, Father, we thank you. Uh, God, we thank you for your word. We thank you how you, you get to our hearts uh, in so many ways. Father, you, you continually help us to become genuine before you and, your, and before your word, Father, uh, relieving uh, just the, the pretense um, that, that so easily kind of can cover our hearts uh, in, in our lives. We're so grateful, God, for uh, genuine hearts, God. Thank you for the, the, the Jenkins genuine hearts, Father, as they've uh, really fought in, in many ways, Father, and um, uh, to really uh, help your kingdom uh, to do it. Uh, they really, uh, you know, they saw things. They wanted to help, God. Just thank you so much for their hearts that stick through so much. And, uh, God, I just pray that you... Use them in a great way in, in Raleigh as they go down there, Father. I know there's much that they can bring there, again, to, to help your kingdom as a whole, Father. You, you arrange the parts of the body. You put us right where we need to be. And we are so grateful for that, God, because not only do we get fed, God, but we really we, we get to incorporate into the, the incredible body of Christ uh, in, in, in different ways, in different places. Uh, and thank you so much, God. Help us to walk out with humility this morning. Uh, as, we, as we talk to one another, as we, as we greet one another, as we open your word, Father, to really dig in, as God challenges us to do, into your word. Uh, we love you, and thank you, thank you in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We are dismissed.